I just want to take a moment and introduce Richard. Um, Richard is the principal architect with Cornerstone Architecture here in London. He graduated from the University of Waterloo School of Architecture in 1984 and in 2011 completed online graduate studies at Arizona State's University School of Sustainable Engineering and the Built Environment. <laughs> He's currently completing a master's degree at the University of Waterloo School of Environment and Resource Studies. Since its establishment in 1991, Cornerstone's work has focused on four sectors, facilities for children, public assembly projects, educational buildings, and seniors communities, with projects located across southwestern Ontario and the greater Toronto area. Cornerstone has also been a leader designed been a leader designed for sustainability. In 2005, Richard became the lead accredited professional through the Canadian Green Building Council, which has led to an ongoing interest and involvement in, in the design of sustainable buildings and communities. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Richard Hammond. Thanks, Mary Lee. Um, good morning, everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity of coming to talk to you about a subject that um, I really uh, have become more and more interested in over the years. And I think, um, you know, looking at this audience and the age represented here, a few years younger than me, you are embarking on your careers at a very, very exciting time. Um, for our society because of these issues that we're going to be talking about today. You're going to have a big role to play in whatever you do with your careers um, because one way or the other, we have to figure out a better way to do what we've been doing. You know, we, what we do know is we can't continue to you know, run the world the way we've been running it and we're starting to learn how to do that better. So I hope that um, some of the things we're going to talk about this morning might help you uh, get a little bit better understanding about what this all means. So what I'd like to do is really uh, look at two questions. Um, when Mary Lee asked me to come and speak as part of this series, she explained that the campus is embarking on a um, effort to look at sustainability here at Fanshawe. Uh, and integrate that right across you know, education and activities and operations. Um, and to the extent that, you know, Fanshawe is a substantial entity and a community in itself, we thought talking about sustainable cities would be a worthwhile question. So we're going to start with that. You know, what makes a city or a community or a college sustainable? And my interest, because of my architectural background and all this stuff that I've gotten into about um, sustainable design is what has that got to do with buildings? So why would we care about the impacts of buildings? So those are the two things we're going to be talking about this morning. And under the first question, uh, we're going to go back a little while in time and look at, well, this idea of sustainable development. You know, where did it come from? And we hear it all the time. If you go out and practice in planning or landscape design or architecture, you're not going to avoid the term sustainable development. It is everywhere. And it's a little bit like repeating the same word over and over and over and over again. Eventually, you know, it loses some of its original uh, clarity. And I, I think because um, of the time that's it, it's we've been using those words and what's been happening and we can now see what works and what doesn't work, I think there is um, a lot of evidence now about, okay, what really does it mean, especially for cities. Then we're going to talk about buildings and how we measure so-called impacts, environmental impacts of buildings. How, you, how do you measure those? And we all, uh, and you hear, you've heard from Mary Lee, our background with green buildings and sustainable building design. And we're moving beyond that idea now. Again, green buildings is a pretty overused term. And we're now looking at how those have worked over the years and how do we get better? How do we lower the impact of those buildings? And how do we even get to what's now being called net zero buildings? 
And then my last little thing is a basically sneak preview, if we have time, in my own research at Waterloo right now, which is about the surface above our heads, right? The flat, a flat roof on this building that we're not even thinking about now, or you hadn't until I mentioned it, as a kind of an untapped resource. So that's what uh, I'm doing in my spare time at Waterloo. Okay, so I want to go back 200 years plus actually, to the 1800s and talk about this question of, okay, where did the idea of sustainability and sustainable development first occur? And we didn't realize at the time, or our ancestors didn't realize at the time, but they caused the problem for us now because as uh, we merge out of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution and we the expansion of science, we began to see a human society and the natural world as two separate things, right? We were no longer integrated, you know, as part of natural systems. We understood them and could change them and manipulate them and use our technology. We weren't dependent on, you know, seasons and day and night and so forth. We had electricity and uh, our own sources of power and whatnot. So as we, as society, um, gained all that confidence through the Industrial Revolution, we felt like, you know, this natural world, it's out there, uh, it's separate from us, we can tap its resources, if they're unlimited, we can, uh, you know, dump exhaust into the atmosphere because it's huge and you know, limitless, the ocean, you know, we can put waste in it. It doesn't, it's not, we're not going to affect it. it. It has, you know, it's separate from us. And uh, the slide um, is actually Detroit in 1890. It's a, pic, it's a postcard. And if you look at postcards from that era, you know, sort of the Victorian postcards of cities, it's amazing how prevalent smokestacks are with smoke billowing out of the smoke stack. Because that was a signal of progress, right? It showed the city were, was developing. They weren't, you know, an old hick town anymore. You know, they had factories and industry and, you know, development, right? And, you know, yeah, the smokestack, well, the smoke all goes away, right? It wasn't a problem. It actually was a positive thing. So it's funny to look at some of those images now. Since 1900, some people started to ask some questions about, uh, hang on a second, what is happening? You know, we are having an influence on our, on our environment, on the environment. And one of the most influential thinkers was Rachel Carson, and she wrote a book called Silent Spring that uh, looked at what was happening to birds, mostly, as a result of DDT use and other pesticides in agriculture. Right, part of modern agriculture is fertilizers and pesticides and so forth. And those, uh, the, uh, the pesticides were killing the aphids and other insects and the birds were eating them and the pesticides were, the DDT was building up in the, in, the, in the birds and killing the birds, right? So she was the first one to sort of say, hang on a second, we are having this impact on the natural world. And <coughs> um, we can't ignore it and if we don't do something about it, uh, we're going to start losing species and habitats and so on and so forth. And hence the rise of the so-called environmental movement, you know, in the mid-1900s. So, <coughs> jumping ahead now a little bit to uh, the 70s, when, um, you know, international attention had been um, focused more, or at least it raised to consciousness this question of, okay, well, what are we doing to our atmosphere and oceans and wildlife as the world continued to expand in population? And so the term sustainable development <coughs> was first formally used in 72, uh, uh, United Nations Stockholm Conference was called. It was actually organized by um, Canada and Sweden because we were seeing a lot of effects of acid rain right on um, uh, on lakes on, on natural lakes it's uh, acid rain is mainly a, a result of uh, coal-fired 
power generation, right? The, 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 the effluent acidifies the air, the rain concentrates that acid, falls on the lakes and ponds and kills everything. Makes for nice, clear water, but um, not very healthy habitat. So that was really the first step, the first idea that, well, you know, if development's going to happen, it has to happen in a way that doesn't have such a huge negative impact on the rest of the world. Then the really definitive, you know, that all the courses you take and references you read points to about sustainable development is um, from 1987, the Breckland Commission and their report, Our Common Future. And by the way, uh, I mentioned to Mary Lee that I'll post this presentation on my website and she'll have a copy as well. And um, I try to be very careful about providing credits, illustrations, and so forth, and rather having big, long, you know, links at the bottom. There's a hyperlink on every image. So if you open up this presentation or the PDF of it and click on the image, you can see the part of the report or any of the other illustrations and whatnot, okay, if you want some more information. So, this is in yellow the definition that we all kind of start with. Sustainable development is the kind of development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Right? The idea that we shouldn't be so uh, pig-headed about what we want to do right now today and ignore, you know, limiting the opportunities for our kids or for their kids. And the little diagram is this sort of universal image of um, how we try to look at ourselves, our society, um, our environment, and um, how, where sustainable, de sustainable development is at that intersection of these ideas that um, we have to think about what we do, building cities or buildings or technology, in the context, of, yes, we want economic development, that's how the world gets better. We have to respect the social implications and equity um, as we make the world better. You know, not just for a few, but for everyone. And to do both those things while realizing we have to have an environment um, to live in. Otherwise, all the progress that we make isn't going to be very worthwhile if there's no atmosphere or water um, left over. So um, this is coming right up to present, and um, my prof, uh, Bob Gibson at um, Waterloo, the director of our program there, uh, has collected a few somewhat humorous or definitions of sustainable development, right? Because there's so many now, as I was saying, you know, if you open any planning document for any municipality in the world, there's going to be language in there about sustainable development, right? So he's collected a few definitions. This slide, is, I, I call these ones, this slide, the, the, re, the ironic definition. So uh, you can sort of uh, uh, ask yourself, which one do you kind of subscribe to? So is sustainable development a redundancy since unsustainable activities cannot provide true development? Is it basically a contradiction in terms? It's just impossible. You can't have development and no environmental impact. Likewise. Is it an oxymoron that amounts to believing that you can have your cake and eat it too, right? I mean, can we really do it? There's a lot of people, you know, this sort of deep green environmental uh, side of this spectrum that would subscribe to that view, that we already have too many people on the planet, and the only thing to do is to uh, have less development. Uh, this, the third point, is the one I really like. It's uh, a case of developers getting the noun and environmentalists being left with the adjective. And a lot of my cl private clients would uh, be happy with that point of view. And the last point, uh, a dangerous delusion promoted by those who are unwilling to recognize that we are already overstraining our planet's capacity to withstand our impositions. Most people feel that, you know, at our present rate, we don't have enough planets to make food and water and so forth for the people we already have let alone the others that are coming. There's also some awesome cartoons. Uh, and these are a couple of my favorites. The one in the top right there, you know, it's a typical conference and the presenter is up there like me waving his hands around and talking about all these wonderful things about sustainable development, you know, energy dependence and rainforests and green jobs and blah, blah, blah. And there's the cynic at the back and he says, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? <coughs> 
And I think it's an important thing to remember as we go through here that regardless of what it means or what strategies or techniques you're talking about, I mean, you have to look at there's benefit in making progress about these things and we can really do it. The other cartoon, I just, I love that, that uh, the, the, the world is sort of stuck with us, right? That uh, he has his t-shirt on and I'm stupid and there we are looking a little dazed. Okay, so those are the ironic definitions. Here, there's also the heroic definitions of sustainable development. And there's one of the great heroes, <coughs> Mr. Gore, you know, who has really made this a kind of a life's mission. And so here, those definitions, um, uh, you know, that fall into that category is, is, is one of the landmark steps in human history following opposable thumbs, the discovery of fire, and the invention of progress. You know, this great achievement, we figured out how to do it, uh, we are going to be able to develop this world in a sustainable way. Uh, it's also an exceptionally popular term and vote favorably by all manner of otherwise incompatible individuals, right? It's the one thing we all think we agree on, sustainable development. Yeah, that sounds good. The question is, what does it mean? And uh, finally there, a term everyone can support large because no one knows what sustainability means and or no one agrees what development means. Right? All this terminology. By the way, that's Al Gore's house. So he has a different understanding of sustainable development than I do. Okay, the last one, and this comes from Bob Gibson's book that's on the slide there, is the one I like. And it's a term that offers an accommodation of opposing forces. It recognizes there's this tension that exists, suggesting that responsible stewardship of nature and continuing gains in human material well-being are compatible that it is possible, and I believe that. I believe we can make progress as our human society grows um, and make the world a better place for us to live in and keep the world a better place, period. The issue, um, I think, what falls into two basic questions when we talk about sustainable development. What are the criteria? You know, what are we actually talking about you know, when we use that term. And what's the process for measuring these? And that's Bob, Bob's book, he, he has kind of suggested we need to take this next step and so we'll look at it from a sustainability assessment point of view. And he talks about developing criteria to say, what do you mean? You know, what, you know, is it garbage, is it energy, what? You know, what are your criteria? And what's the process for measuring those criteria? How do you know you're getting better by whatever strategy you're using? That's where I think we're at right now. So let's talk about cities. Cities um, have always been important through human uh, culture, but they're getting more and more important than ever. Um, there's six and a half billion of us or so. Uh, and that top uh, right graph shows <coughs> the rural population in green at the top Blue is the urban population, and we've just crossed that crossover point where most of us on Earth now live in cities. Right? And there, the bottom graph shows population growth. Um, the vertical red line is um, this year, and that's the six and a half billion. You can see the horizontal line in red. And around 2050 <coughs> or so, a little bit. Or most projections of global population indicate we're going to hit a peak, or it's not going to keep going. We're going to add another 3 billion or so, still quite a crowd. But that is probably going to be it. And you know why? It's because that 3 billion is likely to live in cities. And when people move to cities, it has a lot to do with empowerment of women, right? There are employment opportunities. Um, better uh, safety, better education for children. There's less pressure on women to have large families. And that is the big, big impact on population. Very, very interesting effect, very well established effect, right? So already most of us live in cities. The next three billion of us are almost all gonna live in cities. So if you do the math, between now and mid-century, that's 550 more Torontos, somewhere. 
or 8,600 more London Ontarios, right? Except they're probably not going to be in North America. It'll be Asia and Africa, right? India, Southeast Asia, and Africa. And I, um, you know, I have friends that do work in China right now, and there's 10 million population cities in China that you've never heard of. You know, all kinds. Of so the world is really kind of changing. And even North America is expected to grow by about 100 million people by mid-century. So again, just to put that in practical terms, that's eight more Torontos, or obviously they're not going to drop eight more Torontos in the middle of the prairies or something. You know, it's, it's, the, the urbanized areas are going to grow by that rate, or another 300 or so in the terms, right? So cities are, are going to be more important for us to think about than they ever have been before. The other thing we've also realized is that cities are pretty vulnerable to these effects that we're having on the climate, right? We like to think, oh, you know, the power's on and the water's flowing and, you know, our energy uh, is uh, reliable. But uh, we had a huge power failure a few years ago, surprise, surprise, in the middle of the summer, not in the middle of the winter, because of our reliance on air conditioning. Um, and a lot of the big storm events have had huge impacts on cities. And, you know, it's finally changing the tide of even the worst skeptics. Um, my son is <coughs> future master of the universe doing his HBA at Ivy and is uh, the true believer in Bloomberg Business Week. So, you know, there, you can get a more, you know, corporate perspective on the world. And one of their recent issues was talking about Sandy, right? That's a, that's a shot of New York the day after Hurricane Sandy. And it, I love that the cover, right? It's global warming, stupid. You know, like, wake up. You just can't ignore it. So even those guys are realizing that. On the other side of the coin, a lot of the leading environmental organizations and, and their real champions have recognized that, you know what? What we've been doing from that perspective has not made progress. Kyoto, Rio, Copenhagen, you know, um, we have not, that has not been an effective strategy. You know, it's cost a lot of money and it has had very few results. A great, great reference for that is the book on the middle there, Whole Earth Discipline. That was written by Stuart Brand. He's the guy who uh, created the Whole Earth Catalog. You may have heard of that. It's a, kind of a hippie publication in the 60s and he really you know he was the guy behind uh, the guru behind the back to earth movement Stuart Brand and this book is his sort of reconsideration of a lot of the things that they thought were wrong with the world at that time and he said you can see the subtitle there why dense cities nuclear power transgenic crops restored wild lines and geoengineering are necessary a great read and a real contrast to the traditional environmental thinking, even though he was one of the great thinkers. And what it's leading to is a focus on a, you know, a different approach to trying to just kind of fix our climate. We've realized that what we've been doing so far, including Kyoto, just is so expensive and has made so little difference that we need to start looking at ad adapting cities, right, for the changing climate, right? We can't kind of keep our heads in the sand and think, oh, well, you know, we're going to fix it before it gets that bad. Guess what? It's already too late, right? We still need to make progress and do what we can do, but in the meantime, we have, you're going to see a lot more focus on what's called adaptation, especially for vulnerable locations like coastal, um, coastal communities and whatnot. And the idea of creating resilient systems, resiliency, this idea that you know, we need to be smarter when we plan our communities and infrastructure so that it, it can adapt and change and, you know, you know be uh, uh, more responsive to these conditions and unpredictable um, events that might come along. And just looking at cities as these very interesting and complex organisms, right? They're this combination of technology, environment, and culture that you cannot separate and kind of nicely just sort of isolate, okay, well, I just want to talk about, you know, the transit system and, you know, we're going to put a rapid transit line in <coughs> on this street. Well, you know, that has huge other impacts, and is that the best use of the resource in that particular case? You have to look at it as a big 
complex system. And that's the bottom right book. That's the director of the program I did at, at ASU Braden Allenby's book about reconstructing Earth. And uh, that we're doing it whether we realize it or not, so we might as well get better at it. So, um, we talked about those criteria and processes that are, I feel are the essence of sustainable development, making progress. So how do we measure progress for cities? And the fact is that over the last 10 or 15 years, a lot of progress has been made about defining this and looking at what's been done and evaluating and it. Doesn't it or does it or doesn't it make sense based on what people first set out to do? And one of the biggest um, movements is called new urbanism. Those of you in planning have probably uh, uh, heard about the new urbanism movement and neo-traditional design, the idea that we're trying to recreate traditional communities and walkable streets and, you know, to, as, a, as a different way of, 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 of building cities than the sprawling, uh, low-density nature of what we've been up to. That emphasizes, you know, public spaces and um, interesting and diverse design and less dependence on on automobiles. And um, the, um, that movement about making cities better places for human beings has been sort of overlaid with these ideas about sustainable technology, sustainable design to this new standards. It's, there's a lead standard now for neighborhood development. And it, look, it establishes criteria to say, okay, how do we develop a sustainable neighborhood? And, and frankly, uh, uh, as I said earlier, uh, uh, university or college campus is very representative of that kind of neighborhood or community, right? And it, it sets criteria about okay, locating it in the city and how is it linked to the rest of the city that's part of it. How compact is it? How walkable is it? What about sustainable buildings? And um, innovation is such an important um, uh, part of uh, the idea of making communities better. And you can see there's this rating system that they have tried to establish criteria that you can use to look at a design and, and say, okay, what makes this more or less sustainable according to very specific indicators, and then keep track of it. Right? So we can make this kind of progress now because of the evidence that's been gathered out there. And um, the, that top right slide is from the Congress for the New Urbanism, CNU which uh, was a sponsor of the League for Neighborhood Development Design. And they are a kind of clearinghouse for all kinds of projects. So that if you've heard about a project that's happening, it will be on that, um, on that site. And so there's just no excuse not to find out what has been going on as we're trying to plan better communities in the future. At the same time, it's also dangerous to just copy something, right, from one location and climate and economic situation uh, to another, right? Because it's so complex, you really have to do a better job or a good job of translating it rather than simply copying it. And those two questions, okay, what are the criteria they use and what's the process that they've used for measuring it? So when I look at um, sustainable development documents and master plans and so forth, that is my question always. <coughs> Okay, great, got some set, some interesting criteria. But how are they making progress? How do they know that this strategy or that is working once they start to embark upon it? Because I maintain if there's no measurement process, those statements and goals and aspirations about sustainable development, are, they're just PR statements, right? They just sound good. There's no way to find out whether they're really working. A really great initiative in the bottom right corner, that's from the Federation of Canadian municipalities. Uh, they have a program that almost every municipality in Canada is participating in right now called Partners for Climate Protection. It's a five milestone system and lots of resources. So again, the planners in the audience, if you haven't heard about that, uh, really worth checking it out. And again, the link is live. If you were to click on it, I can take you to the site. Okay, I want to talk about a couple of examples because sometimes that helps me. Uh, make these ideas come to life a bit. And when we think of sustainable cities, Vancouver is like, you know, the poster child, right? A beautiful, beautiful place. Um, and they have um, an eco-city plan. And it sets some really um, uh, fascinating criteria, right? Uh, each 
uh, development in Vancouver now has to, as part of this plan of approval, consider district energy generation. In other words, the idea that is there some other way to create more self-sufficient neighborhoods by sharing power distribution, um, again, like you know most uh, college or universities do, you have a district energy energy system. Every building doesn't just have its own independent power, right? You share power and that's a lot more efficient in most cases. Uh, they have to look at sustainable site design, mobility and vehicles, rainwater management, solid waste diversion and mix of housing. So you can see how they've thought about those overlaying environmental, social and economic development aspects in setting their criteria. And and there's lots of beautiful examples there. They've got green roofs galore. That's the convention center in the middle slide. And that's the athletes' village from the U from the Olympics that was planned to be an athletes' village and then converted into housing. Right. So again, thinking ahead rather than just building it for one purpose. So um, the, the thing I don't find <coughs> in their standards is much about how they measure the progress on the criteria. Frankly, and a lot of really good goals not really clear about how they're keeping track of how well they're doing year to year over time. And at the same time, to be cautious about copying things from Vancouver because it is a one-of-a-kind climate, culture, and economy, right? So it's really risky, and I've heard it described as Vancouveritis, right? That, you know, planners in Ontario have Vancouveritis, that, you know, we've all been to Vancouver, we love it, and we just want to make every city like Vancouver. Well, you know, that can be tricky. So be careful about catching Vancouver Ives. Apparently it's highly contagious. Um, another city that the great contrast, I think, to Vancouver and comes up a lot in the, in the discussion about sustainable cities is Portland, right? Very close to Vancouver, very similar in a lot of ways, right? Similar climate, culturally probably pretty close because it's in California, or in the California neighborhood. And, um, uh, you know, the climate is, uh, is pretty similar as well. And uh, they have a very substantial Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. They look at planning and sustainability as part of the same idea. I think they're almost unique about that. And it's a very large organization and a big commitment by the economy. And their criteria change over time depending what they feel is important. So they've been, uh, like Vancouver, uh, concerned about district energy systems, right? You know. Um, sort of localized neighborhood scale energy distribution and they're they're funding that they rather than just sort of setting it as a policy thing they're finding innovative ways to pay for it and similarly they have a so-called green investment fund where uh, it could create a loan to somebody that wants to make a, a green in, uh, improvement and a brand new one that they just started is a kilowatt crackdown competition for um, uh, commercial buildings so you enter a competition to see how much, um, how many kilowatts you can uh, save over a certain period of time. So really tangible and practical information and a lot of resources online as well. And they provide very good reporting of progress. So you can see the chart there. I don't know, my mouse is alive here, there we go. There is a chart, so they look at residential development. They've grown uh, since 1990 by 26%, but they've dropped emissions and energy <coughs> intensity substantially the same. They show you know, growth and improvement in progress. Because um, one way of making, uh, lowering our impacts is to stop growing, right? I mean, that's a simple way to, to, uh, to, to uh, lower impacts. The tricky thing is to lower them and still have economic development. That's, that's what's hard. Okay, so that's cities. Um, and <coughs> I don't know if I should maybe stop. If anybody got any comments, questions, thoughts, objections about cities before we talk about buildings? Wave your hand wildly if, if you want me to stop. So let me keep going. So um, who, who cares about buildings besides architects, right? Um, well, if you care about cities, buildings are pretty important piece of the puzzle. They um, represent about half of our total energy use. You know, goes into keeping us, you know, comfy and lit and constructive. Uh, and 
about 80% of our electrical engines, right? The, 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 um, uh, the huge share of our total energy uh, electrical generation is for buildings. You know, our transportation fleet is predominantly uh, fossil fuel right now. So most of the electricity we make goes to uh, keeping the buildings operating. And um, buildings and the sites that they need have very big impacts on stormwater in cities, on drinking water, waste, uh, what's called the urban heat island effect, that in the summertime the city is hotter than the surrounding uh, environment because of the effect of dark surfaces, including buildings and parking areas. And also they affect air quality. At the same time, the construction industry is a huge economic indicator, right? You always hear reports about, you know, the housing market and is it up or down. So it's a very, very important uh, source of employment and tax revenue. So the so the, the solution to lowering building impacts isn't, or a good solution, isn't to stop making buildings, right? Because that would have a big impact on our uh, on our economy. So um, that's why I think we should care. And um, the other thing that's great about paying attention to buildings is a lot of attention has been paid to measuring their impacts and defining, okay, so what makes a green building a green building? Um, throughout uh, society, everything is green now, right? Every marketing thing that you get, every product that you buy has something green about it. And in the construction industry, um, about 15 years ago now, an organization called the U.S. Green Building Council was formed to deal with this question, to say, well, you know, can we not somehow form a consensus about what makes a green building green, and how do you measure that, and how do you recognize it? So that's where this LEED standard, I'm sure everybody's heard of, <coughs> comes from, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Uh, it, it, it was created uh, by very widespread consult consultation across the, the construction development industry in the U.S. So it's not a governmental uh, top-down thing at all. To help people understand, okay, so what, based on best evidence right now, makes a green building green? Uh, and it has become the most widely recognized standard for green buildings. It's the one we use the most. And it has these four certification levels. You can see down at the bottom, um, some people call it bronze. It's actually just standard certification. is the basic starting point, then silver, gold, and, and platinum. Uh, we adopted um, uh, the US uh, standard, or, or adapted it, I guess you could say, um, a few years ago in Canada. And we have a new edition now uh, that came out in 2009 that um, one of the things I really respect about the Green Building Councils and the LEED standard is it's not static, right? They look at, okay, how has that standard worked? How have the buildings performed? What are the gaps? And some of the um, early LEED buildings that were, you know, proclaimed as this wonderful idea and solution to all mankind's problems didn't measure up that well because in the early days, our energy models for predicting how buildings would behave, you know, how much energy they would actually use, weren't very good. And there's been a couple of famous uh, 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 incidents where, you know, green buildings turned out to be more energy hogs than ordinary buildings. There's a great uh, example, and a study um, came out of Ryerson for a bunch of schools that were done uh, in the early 2000s in Toronto. The school board needed to build a bunch of new schools. They decided to build a bunch of lead schools and a bunch of schools that weren't lead schools. Lo and behold, the lead schools use more energy than the non-lead schools. Oops. Um, <coughs> there was a few reasons for that. The other, some of the reasons is that <coughs> the lead schools were a lot better quality environment, a lot more fresh air that does take energy. But the biggest issue was a, a very poor energy model. So the new standard lead in LEED now emphasizes a lot more on energy, a lot better energy modeling, and uh, we have to focus on that in the context of everything else more than we used to. And then the, there's a new version now in progress, and it is now going to look at, okay, well, what was the process for designing the building, how inclusive was it, and 
what are the measurement indicators uh, that you're going to use once your building is done. The issue with <coughs> LEED for many of our clients, about half of our projects are, are LEED certified projects these days, is that it, it's expensive. Um, it's very rigorous. Uh, any of you have been through a LEED uh, certified building process before, it's like uh, uh, you have to hire specialist consultants and it's almost like an auditing service because what I really respect about LEED certification is they don't take your word for it, they don't take my word for it. When the building is all finished, you have to send in all the documentation about the materials that were used, where you got them, where they came from, where all the waste went, um, and <coughs> that's reviewed and your certification is based on what you can prove you really did. Not what you can say you've done, you were going to do, but what you actually did do. And that is an expensive process for most buildings. So uh, unfortunately, a disincentive for some of, our, some of our clients. There's a standard that we are starting to use more and more called Green Globes. So it's not quite as prevalent as uh, LEED here, but it has become the prevailing standard in the US actually. It is actually, there are more uh, uh, Green Globes sort of buildings being certified now under that standard than LEED. And Green Globes, if you're not familiar with it, if you click on that link, it'll take you to the site. Um, we really like it. It isn't as rigorous as the LEED standard, but what, comes, what it comes down to is the performance of the building. You know, how much energy are you using? How much water? Again, the standards that they both are based on are the same. Same kind of energy modeling, same kind of uh, design tools. The Green Globe standard is online. Um, and it's sort of an interactive thing that we can use as we're designing the building. And it's full of links to additional information. So it's much more accessible than uh, the, the LEED standard is that requires this sort of expertise to understand it sometimes. And um, the certification process is also quite interesting as well. Your initial certification under Green Globes doesn't have to wait till all this documentation is put together. They take the attitude that their initial certification is based on their building permit drawings because I think it's a reasonable assumption that you know the drawings that you're using to, for building permits, right, are going to be pretty representative of the final building. So that's what they use as a certification initially. And then the second step, they actually send somebody to the building at, right at sort of the occupancy point just to um, walk through and uh, um, spot check certain key features. And then the final thing is energy consumption. You send them your utility bills after one year, right? Because that's ultimately the best measuring stick as far as energy goes. And that's how the final certification is established. So Green Globe is an absolutely excellent system. You can get, um, it's in, uh, it was developed in Canada originally. And in Canada, there's between one and five Green Globes. And in my view, the the equivalency to lead five globes would be equivalent to lead platinum, four lead gold, three uh, lead silver, and two uh, green globes would be similar to a lead certified bill. Now, my colleagues who are the lead um, practitioners don't like green globes. They they see it as lead light or cheating or something, right? And as, as I said, in mean, our discussion about green building design with our clients, always starts with lead. It's the name brand. It's the most rigorous but it comes with a big price tag that's, a, that's difficult for, for a lot of clients, especially in smaller projects. The point about Green Globes is that <coughs> it's still an independent third party review system. It's still got criteria. And as I said, both systems are based on the same, you know, kind of background standards and research and, you know, ASHRAE and modeling and so forth. They both use the same, you know, uh, evidence to determine what makes a green building a green building. So that's green building. A couple of examples up from our work around here um, recently. Um, uh, this one's not too far away. The uh, North London YMCN Library Project, which we did with Perkins and Will a couple of years ago. Uh, big new building, swimming pool, fitness library. It's the gold certified. A couple of the key features it used <coughs> is permeable paving to reduce runoff. Uh, it's got a small green roof area, uh, a very large rainwater harvesting system, and that's something we're doing more and more. One of the things in the new LEED standard is to try to uh, reduce our water use. Yes? Could you just tell us exactly where in London that is? Uh, it's on Sunningdale Road, 
near Adelaide, just east of Adelaide on Sunningdale Road. Um, uh, and uh, a lot of very sophisticated uh, lighting and daylighting controls. Because lighting, you realize there's a lot of the th happening with lighting, you know, uh, in buildings. And uh, it's amazing uh, with the new kind of fixtures, you know, LEDs have really taken over in a lot of applications and controls. You know, the, the lights that you don't need to remember to turn them off when you're not there. Uh, and so, looking at other whys, it's energy use and water use is extremely low. Um, so that has been a very exciting thing to see. Uh, Green Globes project, this one's a little further away. This is in Kaboka, the new um, middle center wellness and recreation complex, it's called. Uh, a little bit bigger than the North London project. It includes an arena, right, a public meeting rooms, a library. It's for Green Globe certified. Um, it has on-site stormwater retention. It has one of the largest photovoltaic arrays in this region, 300 kilowatts on top of the roof. Um, a lot of very advanced glazing systems uh, to um, the different uh, orientations of the building. And uh, uh, one of the cool things, the energy that's sucked out of the refrigeration system to make the ice heats the hot water in the building. So that's a big reason why its energy use is so low, plus the electrical power that it generates. So that's a Green Globes example. And, and as I said, whether it's Green Globes or LEED, what matters is how it works. You know, what are the criteria? How is it being measured? What's the performance? So that's LEED. Um, what we're now looking at <coughs> is not just, okay, the, during the life of the building, how much energy or water does it use, but what's the life cycle of these products? How long do they last? Where do they come from? And the science of life cycle assessment is now what, you know, I've been learning about in my most recent progress, programs. And again, something the construction industry has really taken leadership about documenting, you know, where does this stuff come from and where does it go when we're finished with it? I think it started with waste and recycling, trying to reduce construction waste, and now it's extended right through basically all the products in the building. So you can see there's a typical life cycle diagram where um, we have to extract the raw materials, we have to manufacture the product, we have to put them into the building, we have to look after them, and then nothing lasts forever. Someday we're going to have to replace them and do something with them, hopefully not put them into landfills. So this is part of the so-called life cycle assessment and part of more and more decision making about what we put in buildings. And uh, things like energy can really be surprising, right? Um, uh, insulation is a good example. You know, we use it to save energy, but there's a lot of energy that goes into certain kinds of insulation, right? So uh, depending what product you use and what application it's being used in, um, you know, when you look at its overall life cycle, uh, it can make your decisions different than they would have been had you just looked at, okay, what's the R value and um, stop there. And there's lots of information available. This is a Canadian organization called the Athena Institute that collects uh, building life cycle impact data. Um, it allows you to calculate it and compare different systems. This is a little output from comparing a couple of different construction systems. I think this was concrete versus steel and looking at impacts. It, the indicators allow you to look at the primary energy that goes into the material, how many nat natural resources did you use up, how much have you contributed to global warming. Eutrophication, anybody know what eutrophication is? Any biologists in here? That's, oh, really? That's water pollution, right? That, or actually, it's uh, putting too much, so what happens in Lake Fanshawe, right? If you've ever been to Lake Fanshawe, uh, in the summertime, a little bit off on the on the spell, it's because agricultural runoff has all this chemicals and nutrients that go into the water and it creates tons of algae and so forth. That's eutrophication of, of water, uh, ozone depletion and smog. So that's, it's making our lives more complicated, but the tools are there to do, to get the information if you want to, you know, looking at it um, on a life cycle and that is becoming a very important, or more and more important part of both the green building systems that we use the and well, say, oh, looking, have you done a life cycle impact assessment of your structure? Did you think about your options for the structure itself, or the roof, or 
finishes? You know, was that part of what you discussed with the client or not? Okay, the last thing you know on the horizon is this idea of a net zero building, right? This crazy idea that by building a building, you could you could do it in such a way that it actually had no impact, right? That it could be completely carbon neutral, that it could sequester as much carbon as it generated, that it could generate um, as much energy during its operation as it needs to run and needs to be built. You know, that's where we think of photovoltaics. That by developing a building site on, say, an old industrial property, um, so-called brownfield, that you could actually improve what you had started with. You know, by building the building, you actually end up with a positive result from an environmental point of view. Um, we're starting to realize that a big part of building impacts is where we put them and how people get to them, right? And you can do that in a way that encourages people to use transit more often. So it actually reduces vehicle use. And then, you know, part of vehicles, <coughs> now we're starting to put in recharging stations, right? We're starting to suck see plug-in hybrids being more and more common. And so that's something else we're doing. And so uh, if you're interested in this idea, ASHRAE has a publication, uh, Vision 2020, about how they think we can do this. How can we create, you know, economical, you know, viable net zero energy buildings? And um, there's an organization called Architecture 2030 that shows a path to achieving the same sort of thing based on both energy and carbon, so-called carbon neutrality. Um, <coughs> the 2030 challenge. I guess the energy, the art. The, the engineers in Ashray are better than the architects are because we're, they're going to get there by 2020. It's going to take us another 10 years. Uh, and then actually we work with a great organization called Zero Footprint to certify our practice um, as carbon neutral. We work with them to measure all the activities that we do, courier, and you can make us keep track of lunches and uh, all kinds of stuff. And help us identify, you know, where are we we eliminated tons and tons of paper and travel. We do a lot more um, online meetings with clients, right? It's amazing how, and you know, we do work all over Ontario, and you know, the, we use GoToMeeting software, a lot of other interactive interactive tools, and we do it just because it works better. I mean, it, it wasn't really, you know, the client didn't sort of say, oh yeah, yeah, we want to reduce our carbon footprint, so let's have uh, less, you know, meetings at, at your office. It's more just works. And it saves everybody traveling from Toronto and Kitchener and, and Windsor. So things like that are all possible if you kind of think about it. Okay, last couple of slides are my, my little thing. There's a little sneak peek at what my research is about at uh, Waterloo. It's about this surface above us here, right? That flat roof that, you know, we don't think about. But it does a lot of things for us. You know, as we're sitting in here uh, listening to me rant, yeah, rant away, the, that, that flat roof up there is doing its thing. Um, and, it, you know, you, the, my little diagram there shows, you know, what does it do? Well, <coughs> keeps us dry, you know, and collects the rainwater somehow. You normally right into the storm system. Probably this flat roof, all the rain that falls on it goes into the storm sewer and eventually into the river, right? 100% of every raindrop, that's where it goes. Uh, it keeps us warm by um, resisting uh, the heat that would come in, the, uh, in hot weather and uh, heat loss at this time of year going out the building. It reflects more or less of the sun's radiation that also helps temper the um, building's climate and it also heats up. You know, if it's a dark roof, probably it is, um, that would make the campus hotter in the summertime because it's a dark surface that gets warmer. So the roofs do all these interesting things that we kind of take for granted on, until there's a leak or something goes wrong. And um, they are an important part of the landscape. That is an aerial picture of London. It's greener than you might think, huh? We hear about all the loss of tree cover. But it's, I guess that's a lot of lawns as many as trees. But apparently, you know, there's a big uh, study from satellite telemetry that was done and it said on average you know cities like London are almost half vegetation in fact a little bit more than half vegetation and then about a third not quite 
roofs and um, about you know 18 20 percent of roads and parking and then the rest so you know that roof number shows you it's a pretty significant piece of the puzzle and there are a few things you can do on flat roofs um, normally they're leftover space if we went up on this roof right now we probably see what we see in that top slide right it's like a leftover space of you know it's a convenient place to stick the uh, naughty bits of mechanical and exhausts and whatnot. That's fine. Um, but we can also use them in more interesting ways. A really nice slide from a roof terrace in New York or New Jersey, I think. Um, you know, they can really be these beautiful, tranquil spaces, uh, especially if you don't have a lot of open space. You see roof terraces more in dense cities that don't have a lot of open space. The point is that, you know, here, these roofs represent about 20% of the surface area of London. If you add them all up, there's 20% of our land area up on low surfaces. And, you know, I think of it as kind of real estate that we're not taking advantage of. It's like, a, you know, it's a surface up there that we could be developing somehow. Um, and it's already sitting there. So there's some exciting things to do on flat roofs, right? The first thing we all think about is a green roof. And uh, I think your transportation technology building has a big green roof, right? And that's becoming more and more common. Uh, we could also put solo, uh, solar collectors on them. And again, that has been highly promoted here in Ontario and a lot happening with that technology in North America. One of the most important things and one thing that we see a lot of opportunity to do is collect the rainwater. It strikes me as a little crazy that you know, here or in most other buildings, something like two-thirds of the water that we use that comes out of the lakes and is treated and pumped to London and into our buildings, we flush it right back down the toilet. Right? We don't drink it, we don't use it for showering, it's, it uh, gets flushed literally right back down the toilet. Where at the same time, there's all this water that Mother Nature provides for free that falls on top of our buildings that we just put into the river. So there's more and more work being done in a lot of our projects, including the one in North London and others that we're doing right now. You know, all you have to do, outside this building, there's a pipe that goes to the uh, manhole in the street, right? The storm manhole. And you just put a cistern in there with a pump in it, right? And you pump that water back into the building and in a, in, a, in a school or a building like this that has big banks of washrooms, it's not that hard to get that water line back to the central toilet bank and use that to fill the toilet tanks back up. It's a very, you know, technically straightforward and boring idea, but it's a lot of water. We do that at the, the cap building as well. Okay, excellent. Yeah. So, you know, it's just a simple thing to do that we just don't think about. Problem is, it doesn't make a lot of economic sense. You know, that's still some piping and whatnot. And we don't pay enough for water right now to make it worthwhile. You have to put a value on that resource to make that decision worthwhile. The last slide at the bottom right there is uh, solar thermal, right? That, the idea that um, you can use it for hot water heating. And that's a very practical thing to do. There's a lot of great resources for swimming pool heating as well as houses. Uh, uh, domestic hot water heating systems now come with little sol solar thermal collectors for your house. And um, I remember seeing a few projects at ASU where these two are combined. Um, the issue is present solar photovoltaic technology only captures maybe 15 at the best 20% of the sunlight that hits them, right? Because the technology for collecting the, uh, the light is that it is, it isn't that efficient. And the rest of it is just, it just heats up the panel. If you go up onto a roof and of a photovoltaic cells on the, in the sun, you've got to be very careful. They get extremely hot, right? Because they're, they're collecting 15% of the energy and making electricity out of it. And therefore, the other 85% is heating up the panel, right? So they're really hot. And there's systems now that combine these two things, right? That behind the photovoltaic panel, you've got a solar thermal panel that takes the rest of the heat and heats the hot water. So all this kind of stuff is, is happening now. Oop, I just opened up that link, excuse me. I just wanted to show you it works. 
Um, okay, this is the, really the kind of concluding slide about what I'm up to right now. And out of all the things that the roofs do for us, I'm interested in helping people measure energy, CO2, water, and the present value of the roof systems that you can choose from. And I'm developing an online tool so people like me can log on and design two alternative roofs, right? You can pick the insulation and membrane and what kind of combination of green systems that you want, and it'll do the math for you. Do a life cycle calculation to say, okay, for your roof, here's how it performs, or these are what these two options that you're looking at perform based on those criteria. So uh, that is what I'm up to to help reduce the impact of buildings on cities. Thanks for your attention. Yep, questions, anybody for, for Richard? Comments? Disagreement? <laughs> yes? The last day of your talking about when will that uh, tool be available? Yeah, that's what my thesis advisor keeps asking me, Alan, so thank you for <laughs> nagging. Um, yeah, it's this problem with having a practice to run. I, I'm hoping to have my thesis done in September. So my tool key, if you want to check in on my website, I'll provide a link once it's set, ready for showtime. But like I would think probably that, probably by September it'll have a working tool. Yeah. You'd like me to test for you? Sure, yeah, if you want to. I'll, 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 I'll come on my advice we'll without somebody asking. We'll, we'll have them come back and do a live Yeah, there you go. Gary. Um, going back to your, your discussion about the, the, the urban development. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I've had the good fortune of uh, visiting Portland on a couple of occasions in Vancouver as well, and they're very progressive in terms of their, their plan for sustainability. But I also live in the city of London, Ontario, which is less than enthusiastic when it comes to sustainability planning. You see, what, well, let me put it this way. What do you see as the biggest barrier in getting cities online with sustainable planning? Um, I think it's uh, um, a lack of com ability to communicate the benefits to the, pop the, general, the wide population. You know, those of us in this room, we're aware of and enthusiastic and interested in these things. The average person is like, huh? Because they're inundated by all this terminology that I've been talking about, right? So I think the biggest barrier, you know, for a member of council who has to, you know, they're trying to struggle to keep the cap on the budget again this year, right? to look at these sorts of things is, well, you know, how can, what value can we put on this idea or that idea? The, actually, London has made a lot of progress. They are one of the leaders um, on the Federation of Canadian Municipalities Partners for Climate Protection Program. If you go to that website, you'll see London has actually been doing a lot. They're, they have been furthest along in establishing guidelines and uh, criteria for themselves. But um, it is, you know, a question of putting a value on these ideas, right? Um, and, and that difficult discussion that you have to have about, okay, what's more important in all these, you know, competing interests, um, and what what uh, makes the biggest difference. The thing, the one concern I, I I do see here locally is a little bit of an tendency. You know, I think we do have a little bit of a case of Vancouveritis sometimes, and rather than, you know. Starting with, okay, what would make the single biggest difference here? Um, we tend to be inclined to jump on the bandwagon and talk about, you know, uh, LRT lines or other, you know, very uh, exciting sounding things that other communities are doing that maybe don't do as much good here in London, say, as um, rainwater harvesting, like at the Pickham example, right? I think. Uh, um, it, it's, you need to kind of try to boil that down, and uh, I know, uh, again, I would give a London a lot of credit. Jay Stanford at the city is their, uh, sort of their champion for sustainable development, and, uh, and I know he has made a lot of progress actually here, in his small steps, you know. Um, we don't have the resources and economy and climate that we see in Vancouver and Portland, so I think we have to be more pragmatic about it sometimes. 
Um, but I would say the barrier is, you know, communicating the benefit to the to the to the wider audience about whatever it is you want to do. But those tools are available, and, and I think the, the ability to kind of explain to people, well, we want to do this because here's the benefit to you in your house or your business. And Jay Stanford's group uh, is actually going to be uh, taking part in the speaker series. They're going to be our speaker in March. So they're going to be coming and talking about how they're trying to um, push sustainability within the municipality, what they've done and what they hope to do for residents and for students. So. Steve. Hey, Richard, how are you doing? Great. I arrived late, so if you spoke of this, uh, excuse me. Uh, as you know, uh, I believe I'm, I'm writing this, the uh, municipality of Toronto is the only municipality in Canada that uh, is allowed to legislate uh, green roofs mm -hmm. uh, because of the municipal act and the parochial view of the province. Can you give us your thoughts on whether we should obligate through legislation uh, some of what you're talking about, as you know, in this chair of urban design peer review, and what I see is right where the staff stand in terms of their interests, but there's quite a large gap between their thoughts on where we should go and where the average developer is at. Yeah, um, yeah as, as Steve mentions, Toronto is one of the first municipalities uh, in North America to, as part of a building permit process, have a requirement to include a certain amount of green roof area. And if you don't, you have to, it's almost like a parkland dedication. You know, if you don't have enough parkland, you have to pay into a fund. Similarly, if you, for some reason you can't do enough green roof, you have to pay into a fund that supports uh, uh, putting green roofs on existing buildings. So very, very well thought out and effective program. Um, uh, and, and there's a few others like it, Chicago. In fact, I spoke at the Green Roofs for Healthy Cities conference in Chicago in the fall about some of my work there. And, um, my only concern about that specific strategy and green roofs in particular is that they are perceived and promoted by the green roof industry that's pretty vocal as the ultimate thing to do on a roof. You know, there's no better solution for a flat roof than put, putting grass on it. Well, you know what? That ain't necessarily so. And it depends on what are you trying to, you know, what are the criteria? You're trying to, you know, reduce runoff or save energy or what, right? So to me, I think um, uh, there is a, a, a role for some kind of regulation, but in, in a smarter way. And I know the, the green roof bylaw in Toronto has been challenged because, listen, there's other ways, if, you know, if we're trying to save energy, we're trying to reduce water or habitat, there are other ways of doing that, that you know, green roof is one of them, but that's not necessarily the only solution for every building and every application. So yeah, I think, you're starting to see now smarter and more flexible standards so that allow some leeway for the designers to decide, okay, here's what we want to do. We want to, like, um, uh, Pork Equipment, I think, has a standard now where they say, listen, we want you to have this much less runoff from your roof, right? That's what we meant. That's what, we, that's what we're measuring. That's our criteria. How you do it is up to you. Green, here, you know, and they give you some suggestions including green roofs, but it's ultimately up to you how you do it. So it's more, what are the outcomes, rather than saying, no, you have to, they're giving the prescription that you have to have a green roof. No, you know, here, what are we trying to measure? That's the strategy I would say would be better. Yes? You've spoken about uh, rainwater harvesting. That seems to be such a no-brainer. Yeah. Is really? Just because of the, the cost? And, and you wonder why don't we do it? It's because we take it for granted, you know, that we turn the tap on and out comes the fresh water and it doesn't cost us very much. We wash our cars and water our lawns, you know. We just don't put enough value on the water. We may need to sooner than later. And um, <coughs> I actually gave a talk a while ago to the technology, um, the architectural technologists uh, here about rainwater harvesting and a few examples and how it's part of the building code now because you have to be careful. Um, when you have a cistern that has rainwater in it, <coughs> not very safe to drink, right? Gets a little stagnant, especially post Walkerton. Everybody's really nervous about, okay, being careful with that water. And you have to make sure you've labeled that pipe real well, that it's non-potable water just for toilets, right? Um, and somebody pointed out that, well, gee, once upon a time, London didn't used to have a water, you know, municipal water supply, right? When London first developed in the 1800s, everybody had a cistern, usually it was in the roof, right? It would collect water and then you wouldn't need pressure and it would just run down through the building. 
And so uh, <coughs> there's no reason that they can't be done. It's just not all clients are able to justify it, you know, on a shared economic basis. But more and more can because they're putting the value on the water and they want to show some leadership. Or it's be if they want a green building, it's almost mandatory. With I think every lead building we're doing right now has a cistern. We're doing a new long-term care facility on Highbury, north north of Oxford. It has a big cistern. Uh, King's College, we're doing a new student life center at King's, it has a cistern. So you're starting to see them more and more. It, and, I, and again, I think just um, we forgot how to do it. You know, like the construction industry just sort of forgot how to do it. Apparently, cisterns are really common out east coast. Um, you know, a lot of people have them out, out there. And I think it's just that matter of time. What's the residential application for, for that kind of? For, for, for cisterns? Yeah. Um, you know, I think. Uh, the real simple re residential application, I think you can get a kind of jazzed up rain barrel from a Lee Valley. Right? You, you know, instead of having the rainwater leader just go right into the ground or out to the street, you know, they have a rain barrel that has a cover on it, keeps the mosquitoes out. <coughs> so at least you can use it for irrigation. Yeah. Um, the next step of, you know, bringing a line into your house at the scale of a house is a, is probably a little complicated unless you're really motivated. The great thing about buildings like this, like I said, is you use a lot of water for flushing toilets in this building and all the toilets are in one place. So, you know, other than the scale of the system, you just still need one cistern and one pump and one supply <coughs> line, right? So it just makes more sense in a big building. Yep. Are there incentives uh, for LEED certification or the green globes um, other than the shiny sticker? Like, do you f have, or do you see clients who are just, they already have their own incentive to develop like this, but they don't pursue the certification process? Yes, um, so there are various incentives. Um, and uh, right now in Ontario, um, Interestingly, the only um, it's actual economic incentive that our clients get to make their buildings greener, surprisingly, is long-term care. You know, who knew? Uh, long-term care funding now is tied to lead performance. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. And uh, the, 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 there's a basic requirement to have all new long-term care facilities. You know, that's what we used to call, that's what used to be called nursing homes, uh, lead certified. Period. And you get an incentive to go to lead silver. And if you know what you're doing, it's reasonably uh, easy to do. And suddenly, our you know our private sector nursing home clients, we do a lot of that sort of work. Um, you know, they're pretty conservative people by personality type, for whatever reason. That's that kind of industry. Suddenly, they're all lead advocates because hey, you know it's worth it, and it's not that hard to do. So that's a, that's a kind of a rare example. <coughs> um, but there are a lot of studies, you know, and sometimes I think it's somewhat of a difference between Canada and the U.S. Canadians, that's the first thing we always think about, okay, so where's the funding or the government grant for this or that? In the States, I think they think a little bit differently. They look at it, well, how can this give me a, an entrepreneurial advantage? And there's a lot of really good studies now in the U.S. that for office buildings, right? Office building A, not LEED certified. Office building B is LEED certified. The occupancy, is, a, is significantly different because lead is well enough understood and the people know it means something that that developer with the lead certified office building is going to have a you know a fuller building and that is huge that's the thing in, in real estate development is having occupied buildings right so it doesn't take much to make it a very big incentive from a you know entrepreneurial point of view but it's a bit of a cultural thing, I think. Canada, you know, we're a little conservative. We don't want to take that chance. If the government, you know, makes up the difference for us, we will. Um, but just on that same point, what about the energy savings? In the long yes. The, what's the payback on getting a silver or even a lead certified? Right. Uh, a, a, a fascinating and controversial question. And that always is what the client asks, okay, you know, because they've heard from the true believers of Lee that, oh, well, you know, 
this is what you know people like the counselors here as well. Well, the lead buildings pay for itself. We shouldn't have to add any money to the budget because you know you're going to save all this energy. Well, obviously it depends what you're comparing to. Like okay, so so savings compared to what? And I say to our clients, like the school boards, the municipalities, and our private sector institutional clients, <coughs> that you know what? They aren't you know speculative developers that throw up you know the basic minimum building to code and you know sell it and leave, right? They like you guys here know that you've got to look after the building for its whole lifespan. So before even looking at lead, they're looking very seriously at you know energy in particular, right? And and durability of materials and systems and lighting, you know. So the energy performance of an ordinary building that's required under the building code is actually quite good, right? So if we're comparing to that pretty good building that, you know, isn't LEED certified and then taking it up a notch to make it a LEED certified building, you know, the especially basic LEED certification isn't going to be that much more performance, neither is it really that much more of a premium. I say to our clients, if the buildings that we do, you know, and we went through this, uh, we did a, a Green Globe school actually with the Thames Valley School Board, Stony Creek Public School is a Green Globe, it's the first Thames Valley Board Green School. And uh, they were very anxious about it because of how tight the school funding is. And I said to you guys, do an excellent job with the energy performance and systems and building automation and the building envelope. And we did it as a kind of a test case to see, okay, where would it rank? Right? without spending a nickel more, other than going through the Green Globes process, which hasn't got a big premium. And lo and behold, you know, they got a three globe certification and performed really great. And it was more sort of a recognition that the fact that, hey, you know, they are doing a pretty good job with their building. So, uh, but for most of our clients, the go to basic lead certification isn't really a big premium. Going to silver is usually a percent or two, gold maybe 5%, I'm talking about premium on construction cost. And platinum is, platinum is reserved for the really innovative pushing the envelope sort of things, right? That outside of, you know, research or some kind of very um, innovative and well-funded project, you know, we don't see a whole lot of platinum buildings, but those are sort of the percentages. So basic is almost no premium. Silver, a percent or two, gold, maybe 5%. So the buildings we do that are gold, like the North London Community Center, Kings, and so forth, you know, the North London Community Center, I think that was $2 million, right? That they had to, and then, you know, Sean Elliott, the director of the Y, we, you know, we had this big presentation. He said, folks, this is $2 million of less gymnasium equipment and exercise, or, you know, do we want to do this? Right? And I explained that, well, you know, yes, it's going to save some water and, you know, be a bit more energy efficient than we might otherwise have done it, but it's not going to pay for $2 million very fast. Right? So you simply have to make a value decision that the organization has to to say it's that important. We do put a value on these things beyond their simple payback. Yeah. So if we follow up to that, do you think that, and I've sort of gathered this from what you said, but there seems to be um, a disconnect between um, economic or financial value and maybe inherent value, and it, do you see that as sort of... Well, issues? sure, and um, you know, let's go back to one of my first slides, right, those three circles of overlaying, you know, that Venn diagram, you know, the econ, economic. You know, in the, if that's sort of a client's mind, right, the economic maybe is the really dominant one. The social is important, right, because they have clients and users and things and people that they want to make sure the building works well for. And then the environment one, at least up till now, has been a, you know, that diagram doesn't have three equal size circles, I guess you could say, right? But they're starting, you know, those proportions are gradually starting to change. For Not for everybody, but for more enlightened organizations. And, hey, all of us, the community at large is starting to ask these questions, especially public buildings. Right? Well, how, you know, how well are we doing with this with other buildings? Any other questions? Or? Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for coming out. And uh, it was, I think, 
very interesting talk. No, I was repeated. So th and thank you guys for coming and uh, keep your eyes out for our next talk, uh, February 8th, and uh, hope to see you all out then. Thank Thanks, you. Okay, that's the link to our web, uh, website. I'll, I'll put a PDF of this up there this afternoon.